I'm going to begin there. Mm -hmm. Welcome to this Green Party webinar. My name is Zach Polanski. I'm Deputy Leader of the Green Party and one of our three members of the London Assembly. This evening, we're going to be talking about inequality, uh, lots of aspects of inequality. What does a more equal uh, society look like? How do we get there? Why is it important for everyone to strive for this? And what other benefits are there to a more equal society beyond the obvious? We're going to be asking some of those questions and more with our panel discussion that's going to be beginning shortly. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes just before we do that. Um, there will be a panel discussion until seven o'clock and then we'll be going out into a Q&A. Anyone can ask questions. You should see a box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Type your question in there and I'll be putting those questions to the panel later on. We are a democratic party and Q&As will be decided democratically too. So you can vote up any question uh, that you prefer to be asked and then it will have a higher chance of being asked because it will go higher up on the list. So please do get involved with the Q&A feature. Um, if you have any technical questions, there's a button at the bottom of your screen that says chat. Uh, that will go straight through to the moderator so not everyone can see those questions, only the moderator. And if those are technical questions, please put those to the moderators too. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our panel, but I just want to say a more general thank you very much to everyone for tuning into this webinar. Um, and thank you very much to the panelists and everyone who's worked behind the scenes uh, to make this event happen tonight. So um, on our panel, the first person I would like to introduce is Councillor Akua Bayenu, who is a councillor in Manchester. I was with Akua uh, just last week uh, out in um, Withenshaw in Manchester. Akua came over to us um, relatively recently from um, the Labour Party. And the times I've interacted with Akua, I have been nothing but dazzled by the sharpness of which she thinks at, her passion with representing her communities. And I think she's been a huge asset to the Green Party already. So I'm looking forward to wider Green Party members and elsewhere being able to hear from Akua tonight. So thank you, Akua, for joining us. Um, I'm going from Akua to another councillor that I'm incredibly fond of, and that's Ria Patel, who was elected last year in Croydon. I have met people in the Green Party who I know literally joined the party because they were inspired by Ria's election in Croydon. And I think that meant so much to the people in Croydon and to the party more widely. So I sound like I say nice things about all of our councillors, but Ria and Akua, I think, are in particular examples of uh, absolutely brilliant councillors that we have in the Green Party. So I'm stoked to have them on this call tonight. Uh, the other thing they have in common is they are on the Diaka Fund board. For those who didn't know Diaka, uh, he ran for us in the, uh, Manchester to be the uh, Green Party Mayor of Manchester and sadly passed away in 2017. A fund was set up in Diaka's name that is looking at people of colour, uh, removing barriers for them to getting elected both internally and externally within the party. We're talking about inequality tonight and no conversation about inequality could ever happen without talking about racial justice or more likely racial injustice. And we want to do everything we can in the Green Party to remove those barriers. And we know a huge part of that is financial. There is a link in the chat. So if you are able to, please do donate to the Diaka Fund. I'm sure Ria or Akira at some point this evening will talk about what the fund does but um, essentially making sure we're representing Greens of colour within the party. And then finally, keeping up with our fantastic guests, we have our final guest with us, who is Richard Wilkinson. Um, you might know Richard for lots of things, but my uh, personal knowledge of him was from the spirit level, which I believe came out in 2009, which seems a long time ago for so many of us in politics. I think that really... Um, crystallized so many ideas that had already been floating around the air around systemic change and the benefits um, uh, from a more equal society and so many of the themes we'll be speaking about tonight. Richard though also is an Emirates professor of social epi ep epi Demology, such a complicated word. Richard will have to correct me in a moment, I'm sure. He is co-founder of the Equality Trust, and he wrote the Club of Rome report, which is from inequality to sustainability, which I'm sure we will be moving on to shortly. And um, so if I can begin tonight um, with a cure, the first question is about um, essentially what are the key drivers, factors of inequality in society today? Hi, thanks, Zach. And it's really good to be here, actually, with all of you. Um, unusually, I, I wrote an answer because normally I'm, I'm able to spill it out, but I've had a day. Um, <laughs> but I think I can actually talk about it. So I really wanted to go quite far into history in terms of where I think uh, the way society is currently constructed. And that is to look at the impact of colonialism and imperialism 
on the way and actually even prior to that because a lot of the methods that were, were exported through uh, colonialism and, and imperialism were actually developed uh, here in the UK in terms of the exploitation and submission of work of working people um, but I think if we're going to really understand how human beings are manipulated to actually engage in oppressive practice, we I think it's a good place to start in terms of looking at why there was a need to create um, uh, an, an other, uh, other people in order to maintain the power dynamics that we have in society today. So I look to the impact of colonialism on Africa particularly, that's where my roots come from in terms of my political understanding. And I am I'm here, I'm here as a counsellor, but I guess I think of myself predominantly as a political being, but as an activist. Uh, and my training was in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and it really looked at how society is shaped around gender and class and nation. Most people say race, but we are, after all, if we don't start believing in ourselves as a human race, rather than all these divisions, so nation, I would put it. And, it, and how that embeds in people's thinking. So that actually what we get to is an almost poor point, and I think this is still really prevalent, that actually the issues that oppress people, people have deep in their heads and be, have been trained to think it's based on some um, measure of inadequacy in those people so that people don't have decent housing because they come from the wrong class or the wrong cultural background it's somehow their fault they don't have they're not they don't succeed in education they don't you know they don't get good jobs and if we have that as a starting point which dehuman de humanizes a whole sector of society so that actually rather than looking at how inequalities are actually created we make them the responsibility of the most oppressed um and i so for me it, there is a lot to be gained at how how that came to be why was that the message why it serves capitalism and and doesn't serve people and there are some there are some innate i think misunderstandings that come from that as well so i mean I believe in Darwinism, the survival of the fittest, but it's capitalism that teaches us that that is the survival of the fittest means the most aggressive, the most able to work in the market, the most sort of forceful. When actually in reality, if we look at society, the most fittest are those who are most able to collaborate. So there are lots of messages that we have that have come from colonialism that really impact on how we move forward. So I, I really just wanted to lay that foundation uh, down before we go into maybe looking at the more recent examples of, of the factors impacting on inequality. Thank you, Akua. You really hit the ground running there. There was no warming up. You were straight in there with, with the, the big headlines. Thank you. Um, Richard, we put in the chat um, some of the work the Equality Trust do so people can sign up to the mailing list. Akua has clearly laid out lots of themes there, particularly the, the problems with capitalism. And from your point of view, how much of this is a key factor and what other factors are there to in inequality? Well, I think that uh, material differences have always been absolutely key. I think uh, that uh, we have a tendency, when I say we, I mean the vast majority of uh, humanity, to regard uh, group people and groups of people as inferior if they have lower living standards. I think that was really important in colonialism. Uh, different ethnic groups were regarded as, as clever or not according to their living standards, their technology and so on. I think we do that in our own society. Uh, you know, the sort of prejudiced idea that the poor are poor because they're lazy and stupid, all that kind of thinking uh, is because material standards are so fundamental uh, and as material differences uh, within our society gets bigger so does the uh, tendency to uh, well so does uh, the, the gender and ethnic uh, pay disadvantages um, <clears throat> more unequal societies overall are also the societies that have uh, bigger ethnic and gender um, inequalities. Um, <clears throat> I think this is very fundamental to human beings. Um, and of course, the, the society where societies where that didn't happen are the hunting and gathering societies of our prehistory, um, but as soon as which were extraordinarily egalitarian. 
But as soon as uh, there starts to be inequality and possessions are seen as a mark of status, we get into all the problems that inequality generates. Um, but I do emphasize that it's material inequality uh, that underlies it all. And when skin color or religious affiliation or language group becomes a marker of low social status, uh, it attracts the same sort of stigmatization uh, as poverty does. Um, we really can't separate these things. Thank you very much, Richard, for, for that introduction. And then finally, Rear, if I can come to you from hunter-gatherer societies to Croydon in 2023, what do you see as the key factors uh, in inequality? Yeah, so I think we've touched on a lot of different topics already. <laughs> we need to unpack a lot of what we've started to discuss, but um, following on from what Kira was saying about colonisation and the impacts of that, I think the impacts of uh, kind of splitting society into two different groups of one kind of being higher than the other is replicated still throughout the world today. And um, whether that's in things like uh, the waste system is something that's very on my mind currently as Croydon's going through it's kind of a waste uh, change in waste services but the waste system and how the UK exports waste to so many global majority countries creating another kind of two-tier system of within countries to, to this day um, is just one example of how kind of we're continuing to reinforce these colonial ideas but this kind of idea of creating two kind of sets of people two groups of people with some being higher than others is replicated throughout all different protected characteristics um that being kind of race age disability gender um gender reassignment um yeah to continue but i think there's lots and lots of different drivers of inequality and a lot of them being material so things to do with um for example, uh, wages, minimum wage, um, not being increased with inflation, um, increased kind of things like part time contracts or minimum hour contracts, um, things like um, removing of workers' rights or lower kind of employment protection, and things like taxation and creating loopholes for those who are earning more. Um, to kind of get away with not paying as much tax and um, but that's very economic focus but then there's also things to do with health and um, things to do with living conditions and things to do with skills and education that you can think about um, like rising higher education costs and all of these different things create a system or society that we live within that um, is unequal and unequitable um, I'll leave it there for now Thank you, Ria. That was really helpful. Um, Akira, I'm, I'm going to come to you. And really, it's two questions. One, just to see if there's anything you want to respond to that's been said already. And then to move into that none of this is academic. You campaign and work within your local community. What are the effects, the tangible effects of inequality on local communities? Yeah, um, I, it's interesting. I'd, I'd, I'd quite like to address the point that Richard has made, which is, which I don't disagree with in terms of material difference, except that I still think we're looking at history through a through a modern and particularly Eurocentric lens. Um, in that, there the the, um, the wealth and the technological de development, particularly in Africa, has been written out of history, so that um, that even those countries that identify based on lines drawn, created by boundaries by Europeans, will hang on to the notion of kings and queens, whereas it is known that uh, the king's chiefs were not, they, they, they were inherited positions, they weren't attached to wealth. In fact, many societies, it meant that you couldn't actually own wealth if you were going to have that person. There was an understanding of that egalitarian, but it didn't actually mean that hunting hunter gatherer was the was like as far as it, it got you actually had quite advanced technically advanced communities oh, now yes, um, it's just sometimes it can you it, people will hear what what we've been taught so I, I i just wanted to make make that point um and i think particularly for african heritage people and that there has been such a distortion of our history that that it it, it does it feels like um 
we're taught to believe that every technological advancement came out of a very Euro European Eurocentric way. So I just wanted to address that point. So to the other point in terms, I think you're very much asking for me as a counsellor. So that's how, as how I was addressing it in terms of uh, as a counsellor, I do casework. Uh, it's, it's the most efficient way that individual residents can come to me with issues. So I can definitely say that 85% of my casework at the moment is taken up with housing. Um, it's it's uh, both in terms of the condition of housing, um, mould, damp, you know, it, obviously it's been highlighted in Greater Manchester, we have Rochdale uh, and, um, uh, sorry, I've got it written here so that I would be really clear. Um, you know, the case of the young child who was, um, who died, but basically, basically uh, on the conditions of the housing, um, uh, our Ishak's death, it's not isolated, you know, poor housing conditions, overcrowding. And it's like, I always say it's like Victorian conditions, but the poor house is now temporary accommodation, which doesn't work. And still, and actually it's, it's like social and, and affordable housing is just not my administration's priority. Because if they'd followed their own how, their own policy, they would have been bringing that into, into place. So I've got families of six or eight in two bedroom accommodation with damp and mold. And a lot is in the private rented sector, but also in social housing, which I recognize as being under attack. But it's like how to address that. It's like we don't have. We, there is nowhere to put people. And the, actually, recently, I've come across a council officer who is trying to address the question, which is, why are black people, and by that she'll mean uh, people of African heritage, in the worst housing in Manchester? Um, and that is a really important question, because that absolutely reflects my experience. The other things is that communities with what I call cultural connection to each other are hardest hit in terms of short term accommodation, because they're being offered housing miles away from a central community support and they don't want to take their children from the schools where the, their peers look and sound like 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 them to schools where maybe 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 only one of a handful of black students and no black teachers um and actually education is another hugely important part of where i see uh, inequality uh, happening in the communities that i serve we've got things like police in schools and the campaign to keep police out of schools not in terms of them having a pastoral role but actually being brought in to create discipline within schools we have joint enterprise the attacks of young global majority children in schools it's it's documented people are aware of it in terms of these big these big awful cases but actually it's regular it's ongoing it's just like you know um it's it, it's it's prevalent. It, the, the big cases only highlight what is underneath huge amounts um, in terms of the, the impact on on the most oppressed communities. And um, I think the other one is around employment. Ria started to mention it around zero hour contracts around you know, the, the which communities are having the most unstable um, employment. Um, it's not it's low paid work zero hour contracts, uh, unsafe work, which obviously we saw highlighted during the pandemic. Um, and these, these are the sort of, I'd say, some of the regular issues that are impacting on the communities that I deal with. And why I talk about that in terms of, for me, uh, uh, dealing with inequalities across society is I absolutely firmly be believe if you address the conditions for the most oppressed, everybody benefits in society it's it's the starting point thank you Akira. that was powerfully put also um makes me reflect in london at the moment they're talking about so-called safer schools which are schools where police officers are in there um which is completely inappropriate when it should be a youth officer or a social services officer and too often a cover for austerity is to demonize uh, communities and far too often these are ethnic minority communities where young people are caught with cannabis for instance and then given a criminal record as opposed to given help and support or seen as, as public health anyway I'm chairing so I shall stop getting involved uh, Ria can I ask you um, uh, the same question when you're uh, campaigning and when you're working what tangible examples do you see of the impact of inequality on local communities? Mm, I think this is such an important question because it is so vast and broad and inequality it impacts all aspects of people's lives. Um, housing definitely comes up very frequently as well, similarly um, to Akua. In terms of my casework, people 
the housing wait lists are really, 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 really long. Um, and people just can't afford to be waiting that amount of time, but are having to because there's no other alternative for them. Um, and whilst waiting, they're living in overcrowded situations, as Uka has already explained. Um, you briefly began to touch upon kind of police there, and I did want to also bring up stop and search. Um that's something that's really been impacting people, especially young uh, black people um, within Croydon. Um, there's a kind of uh, increased use of stop and search amongst this population when it's not necessarily the most effective way to be tackling the root causes of the issues. Um, as you were saying, kind of things like social workers or youth workers and being able to assist the person from a more holistic perspective rather than criminalizing or demonizing them. And um, for a, especially when it's a minor incident um, or minor um crime in comparison to something that's really harmful or hurtful to a wide range of people. Um, yeah, in, instead of kind of uh, criminalizing and using those types of powers on reasonable grounds, which is questionable, um, yeah, we could be being a bit more proactive and supportive towards our younger people and um, using a more joined up approach of multiple different um, groups, including things like casework, social workers, um, hospital kind of health workers, um, schools, you know, educating teachers, not allowing police into our schools in the first place. Um, there's also issues around um, kind of social care more broadly, I think, um, and people accessing social care and the wait lists in that sense. And um, not hearing back from officers can be quite an issue um, a lot of the time in, in my casework. So people will contact the council, but then won't hear back from them in a while. And when you're expecting people who are disabled to continually chase the council for something, you're putting an additional pressure on them. Um, so thinking from my perspective, as someone with ADHD, um, for me to continuously chase um, for a GP appointment, which is something I've been trying to do for a really long time, get a GP appointment. And um, it can be quite challenging because you've got to remember to chase for the GP appointment that you need. And that can be an issue specifically for people with ADHD to remember that. Um, so that's just one example of something infecting me, but that's much broader within <laughs> the social care system. Um, those are just three examples I can think of. There's loads, loads more. Can I just add that as well as the material effects that you've been rightly emphasizing, uh, there are very powerful, um, if you like, psychological effects. Um, and it's not only the poor who experience them. Uh, there are now good studies that show everyone from the poorest tenth of the population right through to the richest tenth feel more status anxiety, more worried about how they're seen and judged more worried about issues of superiority and inferiority. Um, and that undermines people's feelings of self-worth. Uh, it weakens community cohesion. People are less likely to be involved in community life in more unequal societies. Uh, violence increases. Uh, people trust each other less. A whole range of, of things like this get worse along with the things uh, that you've already been describing. Thank you all very much. I'm going to come back to you in a moment, Richard, uh, just to remind anyone watching at home that you can put your questions into the Q&A and I'll be asking them at the end of the panel session, uh, which will be drawing to a close at seven. There's already some great questions in there, but please do add them. Also, I just want to acknowledge how grim some of this conversation has been already. And of course, it needs to be grim because we're talking about inequality, but we are a party that offers hope. We're going to be moving to some of those hopeful solutions in a moment. And I don't mean that in a glib way. These are deep rooted systemic issues that it's going to take a lot of time to challenge but I do think the hope and the light is that we're a party that are looking to challenge them. Um, Richard, we often talk as a party that there's no environmental justice without racial, social, uh, and ecological justice too, and economic justice too, sorry. Um, how can we make sure that green initiatives uh, benefit and don't harm poorer communities? Uh, well, I think actually the, the question is you uh, gave it to us um, in, in the uh, outline beforehand, is gets the issue rather the wrong way round. Uh, 
So it's not just a matter of ensuring a greener future is a fairer future. We won't get a greener fu future without a fairer uh, uh, without a fairer present. Um, it's important to recognise uh, that we're unlikely to reach carbon neutrality and uh, sustainability without much greater uh, equality. And we know that the the super rich, um, well, the rich in general, are responsible for vastly more of the carbon emissions than poorer people. And if you have uh, policies that uh, disregard that, um, uh, impose taxes like, for instance, President Macron tried in France with a uh, fuel tax, uh, and people will regard it as unfair. You know, it's it's primarily the high consumption of the rich that's created the problem. And if you then try to make the poor pay uh, increased green taxes and so on, it will be opposed. Um, just like the Gilets Jaunes in France, um, with demonstrations that lasted for months and actually got Macron to drop uh, his proposed uh, green tax on, on fuel. Um, I, I think that so the greater equality has to come first. Um, and that inequality by increasing status competition, it increases consumption. And consumption is, of course, a major obstacle to sustainability. Uh, there are now studies which show that if you live in a more unequal society, you're more likely to spend money on a, uh, an extravagant car and clothes with designer labels and all that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, the same is true internationally. The rich countries are mainly responsible for creating the problem of uh, the, climate, uh, the climate crisis. But it's the poorer countries that are suffering the worst effects, um, which are generally measured in, in hundreds of thousands of uh, extra deaths and large scale displacements of population. Uh, low income countries may not be willing to pursue greener policies unless the richer countries provide the, the proper funding for the loss and damage fund. Uh, which uh, they promised to do in 2009, um, but they still haven't uh, funded that uh, up to the extent of $100 billion a year that they said they would. Um, uh, and serious concern was expressed at the last COP meeting um, that the rich countries had fallen short of this, carb this uh, target. So, you know, you cannot ignore the inequalities that have gone into creating this problem uh, uh, in your attempted solutions to it. Uh, thank you, Richard. And I would also add to that that I think there was always the danger in the Green Movement, a small G, not the Green Party, that people would often talk about climate change as being something that would be here in a decade or two decades, as opposed to those countries, particularly in the global south, that are feeling the very worst impacts right now. Uh, Ria, if I can move over to you then to ask really the same question, you know, how can we make sure a greener future is a fairer future? Yeah, very much along what along the lines of what Richard is saying, kind of we hear it all the time that that phrase that social justice is tied in with um racial justice, it's tied in with environmental justice. And we can't have um any climate justice without any social justice. Um, so I think using that as the basis for everything going forward and making sure that the work that councils are doing, work that government's doing, the work that we want, yeah, the work that we want to do to improve our world is is taken from an equalities perspective. So taken kind of you as much as kind of we urge people to consider both kind of the climate in any policy, we should be encouraging people to consider the qualities impact of any policy that we want to implement, basically, is what I'm trying to say. And speaking a bit more, are we going to go on to this, um, about the policies in the Green Party? Or can I speak about this now? I think you can bring those in now. <laughs> OK, brilliant. <laughs> Just wanted to check before I go, go full steam ahead. Um, yeah, so in the Green Party, we have some wonderful policies. So in, I think it's 2020, when... In October, we passed our reparations um, motion um, calling for the Green Party to 
call on Parliament to establish an all-party parliamentary commission, kind of the inquiry for truth and reparatory justice. And we were, were calling for the government to commit to a holistic process of atonement and reparations in, in accordance with the U UN, the United Nations framework for reparations. Um, and this comes off of kind of different, I think it was Lambeth as the first local authority that successfully passed the motion on this. Um, Green Party councillor Scott Ainsley did this in Lambeth. Um, and there was also one in Bristol as well, proposed by Cleo Lake, um, who was a councillor there. Um, there's there's policy more broadly as well that I'm really proud to have contributed to in terms of the LGBTI Quay Plus um, policies that we do have, recognising, for example, that trans parents should be recognised as their gender on their child's birth certificate, which currently isn't always the case, um, ensuring that um, non-binary people are uh, recognised as their gender. Um, looking into things like protecting um, the self-determination um, and pushing for self-determination of gender. Um, we were very um, one of the first few parties, at least the first major political party, to include that in, as a policy. Um, and there's, there's much broader policies that we have. So things, one of the policies that got me to join the Green Party in the first place was our policy on prostitution um, and rejecting, very much rejecting the Nordic model and taking forward what um, sex workers were saying on decriminalisation. Um, of, home, of uh, homosexuality, of sex work, sorry, um, because we we should be listening to those who are impacted by um, the issues that, that are being faced. So within the sex industry, we should be listening to sex workers. When we're talking about race, we should be talking about racialized minorities. We should be listening to racialized minorities. When we're talking about disability, we should be listening to disabled people on this, on these issues and centering those people's opinions when we're putting forward policy. And so the Green Party's policy on sex work is absolutely fantastic. And it was one of the reasons I uh, did join, join the party. Um, I've spoken through um, only a couple, again, <laughs> policies, but there's so many, so many more wonderful policies within the rights and responsibilities chapter. Um, it is going through a rewrite, rewrite as well um, to be, make it a bit more cohesive. Um, but I would recommend reading through it if you haven't um, already. And I can see if I'll put it in the chat. Thank you, Ria. And why Ria is setting up the transform transformational change that we want in society and why they uh, join the party. It's a good time for me to say if you want to join the party, <laughs> gave me a great segue there. Please do join on greenparty.org.uk forward slash join. It's greenparty.org.uk forward slash join. And that link is in the chat. If you're not quite ready to be a member yet, but you'd like to be a supporter or a friend of the party, there's also a link so you can do that too. Um, Akira, if I can come to you, I don't want it to be a meandering question, but we've heard Lots of problems are our in society, and we've just heard some of the solutions and some of the future ideas going forward. I just wanted to see if there's anything you want to respond to, if you want to come back to that question as well around the greener and fairer future. Um, well, I, we, we, it's, it's, it's great, so much coming in, but I, I guess I wanted to pick up on what uh, Richard was saying, which I completely agree with, um, which is we aren't going to be able to address climate justice without everybody involved in it. And in order for everybody to be able to be involved in it, they need to they have to have their now dealt with. And I know that this was so I can actually sort of speak to the point where my gaze shifted or my understanding shifted to really be more inclusive about climate justice. And then that was when I learned about the impact of um, climate injustice on Syria. So we had this wave of Syrian refugees coming and this sort of, oh, why do we have to take them and all that stuff? And actually learning that the desert desertification of Syria was caused in the West by, you know, like the um, impact in terms of carbon production, which created uh, this desertification in Syria, driving people who had been happily living on their land, working well into cities, looking for food, shelter, um, water, and the government not having the resources to deal with this massive shift because it was just not, it was un unexpected. They hadn't planned for it because they hadn't caused it either. It had been caused in the west um and then you had civil unrest and then you had you have um civil war and then you get refugees and they're driven to the west we, we have syria refugees here and asylum seekers and then 
what I realized is that we always have this mantra in terms of people from colonial backgrounds, which is we're here because you were there. And we've actually got a problem now, which is we're here because what you're doing here is impacting on there. And you're, you know, so that for me was like, okay, I, I can't just focus on the the um, equalities issue. I have to understand it from a climate justice perspective. So the, for me, that to go hand in hand. And it's also in terms of looking for, like, looking for a political home for a majority of people. So that what's happened is, and I find that happens, um, is that there is there's been a real push to sort of niche market the green party is just about climate justice and to undermine and undersell how much and how important it is that we're about social justice um so that is sort of addressing that in terms of i'm less going to talk about policy but i suppose as a councillor sort of the things that we might be doing is is motions so we're this this council coming up we're doing a rent freeze motion an end to section 21 evictions actually being and we get such a pushback we have a, a majority labor administration and they're like what are you doing getting out of your lane what's that got to do with climate justice and it's like those things have to be they have to be united but also because if we're actually going to find a way to a fairer future we all need to be in, and the Green Party has a role in that, then we all need to be in the Green Party. We need to be talking. It's like with anything else. If we're not talking to people and engaging with people and giving, having people empowered within the Green Party from every sector of community, we're not going to be able to find the solutions. We're not going to be able to even begin to envision what, what a fairer, greener society looks like unless we're all having that conversation. That's uh, very uh, effective, uh, isn't we? <laughs> I hope we're clipping that, Kira, and putting it all over the internet. That was <laughs> very powerfully spoken. It also reminds me, actually, of one of the first times I really noticed the Green Party. And I know there's been people in the party who've been there decades longer than I have, but it was in 2015 at the um, election leaders debate where Natalie Bennett, our former uh, party leader and now one of the House of Lords, had a moment to speak and challenge David Cameron, then Prime Minister, um, and challenged him on the issue of refugees in Syria. And I remember that being one of the first times in mainstream TV that refugees had even been brought up as a subject. And it was that moment of realizing that the Green Party, they'd obviously care about environmental justice. And we would never say that environmental justice should not be front and fore center of everything we do. But inevitably, as everyone has put it really tonight, by talking about environmental justice, you're inevitably talking about the other things too, because the two things are, or all of the things are intertwined. Um, Richard, if I can come back to you then. So all of this sounds pretty obvious, actually. And I, I think when you could sit down with anyone and talk us through, you'd imagine they would go, yes, I want a more equal society. So what are the obstacles? Why, why is it not happening? Well, if you look at the long term trends in inequality, uh, basically in, in most of the um, richer countries and many others as well, Inequalities were high in the 1920s, and they started to come down. I'll try and do it the right way around for you. Um, they started to come down in the 1930s, and we went on becoming more equal until the late 1970s. And then you get the modern rise of inequality, and we're back up to levels last seen in the 1920s. But that lowering of inequality. Uh, was the growth of the labor movement, uh, st uh, increasing strength of trade unions, the fear of socialism, and so on, which was actually, uh, it sounds odd to say it, good for capitalism. It humanized capitalism to some extent. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, with Tony Blair and so on, uh, the left lost its way. It forgot what it was about. Um, and of course, Thatcher introduced um, legislation to weaken trade unions um, and uh, um, privatization of public utilities, lowering top tax rates and, and all that. So basically, you get this strengthening of the labor movement, strengthening of trade unions, which brings inequality down. And then all that is lost and you get neoliberal ide ideology under um uh, Thatcher and Reagan. But behind those things, uh, the, and I'm tempted to say, that as Marx says, 
the the ruling ideology is the ideology of the the ruling class if you like um and we've been persuaded that the people at the top are better than the rest of us they argue that social mobility sorts the human wheat from the chaff so that people who end up at the top are superior to the rest of us um uh, and then you get I mean, there's lots of strands of this I mean Boris Johnson said that inequality is essential for the spirit of envy and keeping up with the Joneses it's like greed a valuable spur to economic activities but if you if you look at inventiveness creativity even commercially the patents per head of population you find that the more equal countries uh, are more creative, more innovative um, th than the more unequal ones. Um, uh, and that's true on almost every metric that equal, uh, more equal countries do better, whether you're talking about crime or, or violence or economic performance. It's the more equal countries that do better. Um, and then, you know, more on how we're sort of, I think, made to think that inequality somehow benefits us. Um, they convince us that top pay is high because talent is scarce and uh, CEOs to get deep, good CEOs for business, uh, you have to pay them these huge sums. But actually, there are studies that show that the companies with the highest paid CEOs do less well than companies uh, where CEOs are paid le less. Um, and then, uh, you know, we also have a, a widespread belief that is really revolting business that, and still people doing research on it, trying to show that intelligence differences are genetic. Um, just as uh, um, you know, as upper classes, since the earliest societies have believed that the quality, the qualitative differences that account for people's class position. I mean, the Greeks believed that slaves had souls that were made of bronze instead of gold or something. You know, and the modern form of that is this continuing research on. Uh, genetics of intelligence and it's a failed research program I mean only a couple of decades ago they thought that um, they were looking for the gene for intelligence now we know there are thousands of different genes that affect uh, cognitive performance and we all have some of them make us good at more I don't know more spatial things or social things or whatever it is um, uh, and but none of us have all of them where well, we just have uh, many differences and yet there is still that popular idea that the people at the top are there because they're better social mobility sorts us out you know the, these prejudiced ideas that maintain inequality in our society um so uh, i think we those are the sort of ideas we have to be working to undermine to attack to rid our, our country of thank you richard that was a wonderful anecdote to um boris johnson's metaphors about serial packets and rising to the top and actually just exposes what nonsense and dangerous nonsense that was and must always be challenged um uh, we're going to start the Q&A in about 10 minutes time so just a final call out if you have any questions to put to the panel please do put them in the Q&A when I talk about voting questions up you should see that there's a thumb by each question if you would like to see that question asked please do give it a thumb up it will go higher to the list and it will be more likely to be asked um Akira I'm going to come to you um just to note that the audience at home can't see the chat but I know that you wanted to talk about, um, in fact, Richard was just talking about prejudices and stereotypes in society. I don't know if you want to lead off from that. Yeah, and actually it's probably useful because I don't want to attack the individual who made the comment. But, um, and I suppose I also want to address what we would need to do in terms of the internal conditions uh, in the Green Party to make us more 
um, accessible to a wider community. So this is an example, um, and it's interesting because I saw, so the example I'm challenging is, what are we going to do about corruption when we're talking about funding poorer countries? And I saw this wonderful um, thing from, I can't remember the country, but it's a woman, woman prime minister. And she said, why does it always go hand in hand when we talk about African administrations and the word corruption? And because it's part and parcel of this sort of language that we have around um, the qualities that exist in um, certain communities. And it's embedded in our thinking. And I think if, if we have to look at ways of challenging that, um, of challenging that. And I have, I come from an arts background. Zach and I have that in common. And one of the things that I've found when I'm working side by side with, with other activists, politicians, is that we sometimes, we can, especially as so, even as socialists, be, yeah, we, we begin to deride the, the masses, the working classes that then, you know, why are they following the, 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 the media? Why are they believing in these, these theories that actually do them no good whatsoever, that are actually anti their own well-being? And I think we fit, we fail to really look at the impact of the system on individuals in terms of expecting them to come and be comrades with us. Uh, and so there's the impact of self-worth, actually thinking that you have something to say, that what you have to say is valuable, that you will be listened to, that people lo who look like you and come from your background, are va it becomes, it can be self you know, um, fulfilling as well, are valuable. So we have to, we have to be able to pick up at all points when those things come into view and they come in all the time in terms of it's, it's you have the internal issues but also one of the things that I find isn't addressed in this sector is that often if we're wanting to create a society where people come from different class backgrounds then the reality is they may come with less economic well-being so we spoke about the DACA fund which is specifically around um people of uh I call global majority communities that have been racialized through skin color uh, by colonialism, imperialism. But it's actually it's it's more than just getting elected. It's what happens when you are elected. How do you exist? How how do you have an equitable life? So the two things, one is recognizing that oppression exists in our lives. Like I live in social housing. I'm fighting mold and damp in my own house. It's stressing me out to the maximum. And I'm around other people in the same situation. But it's like I step into the, the party and we're all, we believe that equality can just happen if we ignore those differences. And I think that is one of the most dangerous things that we do. We need to be able to really recognize um, how we support each other in the here and now. What are those things that are impacting on, on us in the here and now? If we're going to be able to come together and actually contribute to this and actually come up with the solutions for a fairer society. And so I go back to why I said the arts is because there are, if, if we don't talk about the arts in terms of the funding of opera, which I've got nothing against, by the way, it can be equally energizing but it can often um, fulfill a role of maintaining the status quo. But the actual participation in the arts where people can realize that they're capable of doing great things, just whether it's writing a poem or being on a stage play or dancing. These are the things that we need to really think about in terms of the, in, of hu the human. What does the human need to actually feel able to say there is a solution because what capitalism does really well is it as well as that thing that you were saying Richard about saying that um that some people are just better they just you know is actually the reverse of that is I'm not good enough I'm not able I've got nothing to nice. contribute I can't actually do anything nothing will change um so I'd really like to us to look at how we invest in people believing that they can contribute that they have got something to say that 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 what they have to say is important. And part of that is that when people get involved is to actually recognize what their physical circumstance is. That it, you know, that it, it is, it isn't as easy if we work in, walk into a meeting that everybody isn't worrying about, pay, you know, paying their bills and all their kids being in school. It's like, you know, people, I, I go into meetings where people talk about, say, the maternal statistics of black mothers, 50% more likely to die in childbirth. I have a childbirth raised child. I'm sitting there. That's my daughter I'm worrying about. And there's a sort of disconnect between that reality. If we're going to have equal, fairer society, we have to have an equal, fairer party. And I'd like us to start looking at some of those things. 
Thank you very much, Akua. I'm hoping our Green Party membership and indeed people who aren't part of the party heard that call loud and clear. And I'll just give one more shout out to the Diaca Fund too. That's a practical, tangible way with money that people can support. But of course, uh, what I heard loud and clear from Akua there is it's not always just about money, although that's a huge element of it. But actually supporting people and actively removing barriers is also really important. And just adding my own voice to that as well, that it's really important not just not to be racist, but we have to be all actively anti-racist in the same way that we all have to be actively anti-anti-Semitism or all actively anti-transphobic. And actually, we uh, create a more equal society by making sure we're always pushing for a more progressive future. Uh, so on that, Ria, this is going to be my final question to every panellist. What does a more equal society look like and how do we get there? Big question. <laughs> um, what does a more equal society look like? Um, I think a more equal society for me would look like a place where everyone has the opportunities to thrive in the ways that they want to thrive. Um, and that's a bit wishy-washy, but um, I'd like that kind of people to have, it's equal access to opportunity, but going further than that, um, you can't just give people the equal access to opportunity, you need to support them and help them get to that point. But as the was saying, they feel able to do that, they feel able to speak. Um, there's additional barriers that certain groups of people face and how can we alleviate those specific barriers for that specific group of people so that they can access that opportunity um and not necessarily making assumptions about certain groups of people and ah oh, this group of people are good for this type of role and really letting people explore what they want to do in, as individuals rather than in placing kind of assumptions upon upon people um more practically, I, I spoke earlier about policies than the Green Party has. I think one thing very specifically um, that the Greens have been really um, strong on, um, especially during winter, was the warmer homes, kind of lower bills and that leading to a safer climate. Um, and that really ties in kind of the social justice and the environmental justice elements together, because by tackling things and ensuring that everyone can have a warmer home, and lower bills, you're protecting the climate at the same time. Um, so calling for things like retrofitting and um, heat pumps and insulation from the get go um, ensures that the most vulnerable people are protected and you get warm homes. Um, and that means that kind of you're, you're seeing less impacts in terms of health inequalities, but also less income being spent on it on energy and so you have other income disposable for other things that you want to invest in and it, it's a knock-on effect in terms of you're starting to invest in things like a um, more renewable energy like offshore wind and solar and reintroducing that into the the, the kind of feed into the tariff um at a better rate um and then things like a longer term policy of carbon tax all of those things together help to create a more um, environmentally just and socially just um world so when we're looking at our policies i think we need to take this approach in that yes what will the impact be for the environment but also what will the social impacts be and how can we reduce any um inequality that's being caused by the policies that we're putting forward um and that needs to be embedded within each and every policy Thank you, Ria. That can't be more timely as well on the same day that the United Nations IPCC final report before 2030 said this is humanity's last warning and we've got to make sure we're tackling the climate and ecological emergency while making sure we're protecting people from the cost of living crisis. Richard, if I can come to you, uh, so the same question there. What does a more equal society look like and how do we get there? Well, I, I think I should admit I've spent the last 50 years sitting in front of the computer um, unlike uh, Ria and Ekua, who've been out to talking to people. Um, but uh, the, the research we've done shows that I mean, basically what we did was look at the amount of income inequality in different countries and compare it with all sorts of other uh, social indexes. So, for instance, you find and now, there are now hundreds of studies showing this that more unequal studies have much more violence, um, more homicides, um, and that's true um, of domestic violence as well against women. Um, uh, people trust each other less. Community life is weaker. 
uh, the whole society becomes more antisocial. People become more out for themselves, as I said earlier, because everyone is more worried about uh, status and how they're seen and judged. Um, what inequality does is make money, class and status more powerful. Um, so, for instance, whether your parents' income makes mu much difference to your life course, uh, it does, it makes a huge difference in more unequal societies. But when you look at the, the much more equal countries like the Scandinavian countries, your parents' income is much less important in determining where you go in society. Uh, so, uh, and if you look at much more un unequal societies than we, we included, um, and the most unequal societies in the world are places like South Africa and Mexico. And there it's gone a whole stage further. You see, there's not only more violence and people trust each other less and there's weaker community life, but people are there are actually afraid of each other. They put bars across their windows and doors. They put razor wire around their gardeners' fences. Um, and uh, they think it's unsafe to go out at night, all this kind of thing. Uh, and I may say that uh, South Africa and um, uh, Mexico are very unequal for quite different reasons. But if you look at the other side of this, at what makes for happiness and well-being, you find that the quality of social relations is absolutely crucial. How many friends you've got, whether you're involved in community life, these are the real determinants of happiness. It's the social environment, the quality of social relations that really matters. Um, and uh, it's there that inequality does its worst damage. So it really undermines the quality of all our lives. Thank you, Richard. And I think that's a really interesting distinction you make between academia and being out there on the ground and, and community campaigning. But I, what I would say as an elected representative and someone who's out on the ground is the work that you do and other academics and researchers do is what helps us build the argument and the data to be able to get that change. So um, I know you weren't discrediting your own work, but I think it's always important to say, you know, everyone has a contribution to, to this work and it's important we're, we're not in our silos. Um, Akua, if I can come to you finally then before I come to the Q&A, just for that final easy question. Um, what does a more equal society look like and how do we get there? It's interesting. I really had to take myself to hand because it was the question I found most difficult. And that is partly because facing oppression almost becomes habit. Um, so more recently I've spent most more time outside of my political life exploring this um but with other um community activists who are exploring system change who are um yeah exploring sort of shifts in power um through doing things very differently and a big portion of that has been around um looking at what it is to be healthy now what do we need right now to be healthy to be happy um and so it's interesting what you were saying Richard about what the statistics show you um and how to do that right right this now right now within the state of society in the world is quite a challenge but it's like if we can't if we can't really begin to envision what a fairer society is we're not going it, it, there has to be that light we have to know what we're moving towards so some of the things for me I think really practical things is the idea to break the idea that it is essential for our well-being to be at work five six seven days a week is is sort of built into this system because actually the, that's the best thing because our labor isn't actually for us and our own well-being our labor is for profit so we need to sort of have be convinced that this is for our own good that we slog out hours and hours day after day after day um so i'd really like to start looking at how to bring unions on side with the idea of the same pay for less less hours in work and that needs to be looking at an investment of what else do human beings relish doing that's not about working because there's this whole mantra around um work being you know good for our soul it comes from a sort of very euro christian i think perspective on the sort of 
the, 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 the work and what does work mean if it's unattached to other people's pr profit, which for me is really important. Um, I, I'd I mean, for me to try and look at a world without a, you know, oppressive thinking, whether it's racism, gender, sexuality, gender assignment, um, it, it is, is really interesting. Uh, interesting is not the right word. So people push back against it as if this would create some sort of homogenized society where everybody looks the same because we can't value one set of cultural um, norms from another. That 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 essentially causes um, that sort of conflict. That 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 the fear of other is a human thing, and it's so not. It's so taught to us. So a society in me is where difference is seen and um welcomed embraced enjoyed and celebrated um but not valued higher one above the other if that makes sense so and really weird one would be when you speak to people and it's so hard who go they don't see color in this society now that is one of the most oppressive statements ever and people think if they can do that that means they're living in the present of this wonderful future but it just denies our reality it denies our oppression however yes i would like to see a world where we do see color but that seeing color doesn't make us see less than or less valuable there's a there's a difference so, so it's not like we will get rid of that celebration of difference we won't be frightened of it we will celebrate it and and be it will be full of joy and how can we live that how can we envision that how can we work towards it Ria you're doing much better about Labour uh, Green, oh, Green Party policy than I am because I'm still at the sort of I'm I'm the what liberated me into in becoming in when I became in a Green Councillor is the ability for me to serve my residents better is is you know for me to be able to bring my full humanness rather than being sort of told to follow a line not having a whip a society without whips of any sort because i find the term offensive to tell the truth because it comes out of both women's oppression and and uh, slavery and all sorts of things um I literally now realise that I could talk for the rest of the time on what a wonderful, fairer future would look. So I will opt out to stop. And I'm really sorry that I have to run because I've just been made interim chair of my tenants union. Um, but if there are questions people want me to answer, I think you're going to gather them and I'll answer them in, in writing. So it's fabulous to be here. Absolutely. If I can take this moment to thank Akua both for her contribution this evening, but frankly, her entire contribution as a Green Party councillor, we're very, very pleased to be having her. And I know you're going to continue doing that amazing work. And um, thank you for all your answers tonight. I think we could have done a whole webinar on each of your answers. Um, although I should say at that point that we will be doing other inequality talks in this Green Talk series. And finally, Akira, I think going off to chair a tenants union is a very good reason to miss a talk on inequality. So thank you for your time. Thank uh, you. Bye. Yeah, and Richard um, are going to be staying with us um, to answer your questions. Um, and those questions have been upvoted. So I'm going to start throwing some of those questions to you. The first question is going to come to Rhea. If Rhea thinks they've had hard questions already, this is probably the hardest question of all. Uh, what would the Green Party put in their first budget to address the inequalities in our society? So I guess Madeline Wells is saying, Rhea, when you are Chancellor of the Exchequer, as I know will be happening one day, what are the main things that you want to see happen to address inequality? Yeah, so I think one thing that we haven't actually touched upon yet, but I think Akua was kind of getting to, was kind of the four-day working week and um, universal basic income for everybody. I think that would, it, it is Green Party policy, but having universal basic income for every resident that uh, kind of was fully costed by the government would be absolutely awesome. It would give people that flexibility and opportunity to go explore those things that they are interested in, any passions that they have, um, kind of that, that will improve people's well-being, <laughs> take part in community action, can improve community kind of cohesiveness. And um, as Richard was talking about that, the, the links between community involvement and social relations and well-being there. But also from a business perspective, I mean, businesses will be able to retrain people, invest in more kind of greener <laughs> things in, in the economy. Um, and 
the well-being perspective of the workers um, from the business as well um, and increases in productivity. I know productivity is very kind of in, intertwined within capitalism, but it, having um, less days but the same pay has been shown to improve productivity within businesses. That's one thing I think. Um, another thing I would like to see is proportional representation. Um, I think that would give people the ability to feel like their voices are being heard within politics, which is very difficult in the current voting system where it is first past the post. Um, and um, meaning, making it so that everyone's voice is heard within politics gives people more power um, in what they want um, in politics so that they are more represented. And then politicians can actually act based off of what their residents um, I want to see whether that's in local politics or in government. Um, so those are two things that I'd, I'd put in um, from the get go. Um, but the, the whole rights and responsibilities chapter as well, I was throwing it um, as well. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Rira. It sounds like a, a much better future. Rira also talked about proportional representation and universal basic income there, which is like Green Party bingo. I'm going to come to Richard in a second. I'm just going to ask Dominic to pop in the chat. I'm doing a self plug here, but I do think it's important. In London, I'm working really hard on a universal basic income pilot. I managed to get London Mayor Sadiq Khan to agree to a pilot in principle. And what I'm working with at the moment is engaging Londoners or any community to check, one, that they actually want it, and two, that they're involved in the design. I think within this whole conversation, it's really important that when we do consultation, we don't tell people how we want a fairer society to look like or work like. We actually make sure people co-design what a future society would look like. So that's work I'm looking to do in London that's just been popped in the chat now. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Richard, I'm going to come to you. I don't know if you want to talk specifically on universal basic income or budget or respond to anything Ria said or to answer the question. What I think the Chancellor should be doing. <laughs> Uh, I do think that um, taxes have to be made progressive again. I mean, as recently as the 1970s, might not seem recently for some of you, but for me, 1970s is recent. Uh, top tax rates on the, the really rich were as high as 80 or even 90 percent in both Britain and America. And that was an important part of greater equality. And now they're down to 40-something percent. Um, and uh, so chancellors have to do something about that and wealth, wealth taxes. Um, but they also have to deal with all the tax avoidance and the tax havens and so on. But I think even more fundamental than redistribution of income is to reduce the inequalities in the income uh, before taxation. So the huge differences in the um, earnings, well, I shouldn't call them earnings because I don't think the super rich really do earn it. <laughs> uh, the, anyway, the, the huge differences in their incomes. Uh, and I think the long-term answer to that is forms of economic democracy employee ownership, cooperatives, uh, employee representation on company boards, not just token representation, but hopefully increasing over time, because it's there, it's at work where inequality is created. And, you know, companies are sort of pyramid shaped to the CEO at the top uh, in order to concentrate wealth up there. It's there that the, it's, it, the inequalities are most powerfully generated. And of course, the profits they give away to shareholders, many of whom don't need jobs at all. But um, uh, I think those are the key things that chancellors have to do. Thank you, Richard. I hope Jeremy Hunt is listening and going to take your advice. Um, uh, I, actually, when Theresa May was campaigning for the leadership of the Tory party, she said she would introduce employee representation. She soon got talked out of it by um, the big money people who control the Tory party. Um, so we didn't hear anything about it when she won the leadership. Um, for those watching along online who maybe aren't a fay with all Green Party policies, recently we've been calling for a wealth tax, which is a 1% tax on the wealthiest 1%, so very much for super rich. 
that uh, University of Greenwich have estimated would raise about 75 billion pounds a year that we would put straight into green investment. And that's just one type of tax, of course, alongside all the other taxes that Ria was talking about, particularly around carbon tax and making sure the polluter pays. Um, I'm going to move to the next Q&A topic now, which is coming from, I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling my screen. It's from Sarah McPherson. So if I can come to you again, Richard, um, what measures can be taken to close corporation tax loopholes that allow organizations like Amazon, the Murdoch Empire, et cetera, to avoid paying the taxes they should be paying a different kind of inequality? Well, I, as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm a, a, an epidemiologist, not an economist. Um, I, I sometimes regard economics as a mental illness. <laughs> uh, I, um, sorry, just repeat your question. Um, I think to paraphrase, really, it's looking at do we need to close loopholes around oh, people yes. paying a corporation tax and, and what more needs to be done? Yes, I think that uh, to deal with the tax havens where money is sorted away, where it can't be taxed, uh, we need international agreements. Um, and uh, the OECD has tried to do something, but uh, it ended up with measures that weren't weren't nearly strong enough, weren't effective. Um, and so I think uh, that all has to be um, thought through again. And uh, as I say, it needs international cooperation and probably Brexit makes it more difficult. Um, I, indeed, I suspect one of the reasons why people like, um, well, the, the money behind the Tory party were keen on Brexit is to escape that kind of action. Um, and, you know, Britain, Britain and so British sovereign territories are um, uh, some of the most important tax havens. Um, so that's really what has to be dealt with. Um, and it's interesting that um, people who have small businesses, small to medium sized businesses, talk about, I've actually heard one of them talk about uh, tax avoidance uh, and tax havens as evil. Uh, because He felt that because um, he saw it as giving multinationals an unfair advantage. They could avoid tax, whereas smaller firms couldn't. Uh, they weren't equipped to set up uh, um, accounts in tax havens and so on. Um, and so they saw it as part of a fairer pay playing field to deal with tax avoidance and tax havens. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for teaching me how to say epidemiologist. I have got it right this time. And um, Ria, I don't know if you want to answer either the question on corporation tax or to talk about community representation, because I know that's also very important to you, either or all the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just, I think, Richard, you've touched on everything that I was going to say, but also I believe the, the Green Party was calling for a windfall tax on the North Sea oil and gas. Um, and so and that would package just kind of the dirty profits tax alongside carbon tax. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to add, add that in. I'm not sure if I can find a link, link to that and put it in the chat afterwards. But in terms of increasing representation, I think it's so important <laughs> to increase representation and that our politicians, especially in the Green Party, but politicians more broadly, are representative of the communities that they are meant to be representing. Um, we absolutely need more younger people in politics. One of the things I love doing is going to give talks to groups of younger people who are interested in politics and just getting to know what their ideas are, getting to know what they'd like to see from politics and helping them to find their path into politics if that's their interest. Um, I believe that we need more young councillors specifically. Um, the average age of a, uh, the average councillor is a white man in his, uh, it, who is 59 I believe, in the 60s roughly. Um, and so that kind of highlights <laughs> to me that we need to see more diversity within the council, councillor populations. Um, speaking in not necessarily about politics but also similarly in kind of the trustee world so I'm also a trustee of two different charities um and you see similarities there in that young people aren't represented on charity boards and it's often older um, people and 
and those who are white or middle class and um, men who tend to take up the majority of those um, trustee spaces on, on charity boards. And so even the way our charities are being run on or governed, not necessarily run, but governed, the governance of them is um, coming from people with particular positions of power and within a society that does that kind of privileges those over others and to be tackling inequality you need to be ensuring that representation is is there and those who are representing um people are listening to the communities they're representing but also that those who are sat at the table are being listened to themselves um i've had various um eh, challenges um having been elected where I've been sitting at the table I've been saying something and no one's listening to me but then someone will make the same point and be like and and everyone will be listening to them and I, I was just sat there like I just made that point did I not um and so yeah it, it is that kind of two-way communication between the communities and the the elected representatives but then the elected representatives ensuring that they are being listened to by those who are in administration or by those that they are lobbying. Um, I've spoken very much about young people, but this extends um, to those with other marginalised characteristics. Um, so within the Green Party, we all know that we need to be doing better when it comes to disability, when it comes to race, um, and ensuring that we are getting more people of colour elected. And that brings us back to exactly why we've got the DACA Fund, um, to ensure that we are supporting financially, but also emotionally and kind of through peer support, um, councillors um, and prospective Greens of Colour candidates who are standing in elections. Um, and finally, I will just say that we do have separate candidate funds from different liberation groups. Um, I believe the, the deadline's probably closed for these elections coming up in May, but every year a various uh, liberation groups set up a candidate fund where candidates can apply for some extra funding to kind of support their campaign so LGBTIQ plus Greens have theirs uh, I believe the Data Fund has theirs uh, Young Greens have theirs and um, I hope to see more liberation groups setting up these funds going forward. Thank you Rhea that was brilliant and just to add to that because there's a few hundred people on this call and it's always good to be able to advertise these things that we have a strong Young Green Party movement uh, within the party you can find them on Twitter or Instagram at Young Greens and also the Green Party trade union group as well who are doing lots of brilliant work in these spaces as well as the organizations that Rhea spoke about or campaign groups. Um, we're coming up to near the end of our session now so I'm just going to ask a, a final question to, to each of you. Richard I'm going to go down the list and ask one that wasn't straight at the top but just because I think it's a, an interesting question to finish up on. It was from Peter Mortensen and he's essentially talking about those countries like Denmark and Finland where people generally are happier and seem to be more equal societies and his question was essentially why is the UK not doing more to model themselves on those societies but I, I'm wondering if you want to broaden the question even wider and ask if we did take some of those policies would we be looking at a more equal society? Um, well why we're not like that is because we've elected the wrong government <laughs> but uh, Yes, uh, I think there's no doubt that um, more equal societies have higher levels of well-being. Um, and I think if you pursue I mean, the whole, there are endless different policies that improve uh, equality. Uh, it's not only um, things to do with redistribution, of, as I've said, but also how companies uh, run. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I, 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 it's clear that that is the basis of why the Scandinavian countries do better. And of course, this has been seen for centuries as being, and inequality has seen, been seen for centuries as uh, key to uh, social functioning and that e equality um, is um been seen as divisive and socially corrosive since before the French Revolution. People have known this in their guts. Um, uh, and it's that that we have to deal with. Um, sorry to give rather a rambling answer to that. Uh, 
if that's you when you're rambling, Richard, then you're doing okay, because it sounds like a very strong answer to me. Um, so, Ria, my final question to you comes from Philip Davis. Um, how important do the panel think getting Greens elected from a range of areas and backgrounds across England and Wales is to helping to close the incredibly high levels of regional inequality we face in the UK? For example, we currently have 34% of children in Wales growing up in poverty, but very few of our elected M MPs or Senate members in Wales grew up experiencing these conditions. Yeah, absolutely. I think it ties into my uh, the, what I'm saying earlier in that it's absolutely fundamental that we have people representing the areas, kind of re our representatives need to reflect the areas that they're representing is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so we need to be actively seeking out these people. They may not already be party members, they may just be green aligned, they may be community activists, but we need to be keeping an eye out for these wonderful people who are doing such grassroots um, campaigning and proactively reaching out to them and, and asking them to stand as a Green Party candidate for us. Um, and I think, and encouraging as well, our members who who are more marginalised, um, but might be active, might need some encouragement to become more active um, within local parties. And I think there needs to be a bit more of a supportive system within local parties to, to help alleviate some of the barriers that these people might be facing. So, for example, you may have a wonderful can prospective candidate who um, is disabled um, and may have some trouble being able to walk and deliver loads and loads and loads of leaflets and so setting up a team to support them <laughs> to deliver the leaflets while they get on and do other things is a way to get rid of that barrier. Um, similarly you might have a wonderful person who may not be as confident um, speaking in front of loads of people at hustings for example but giving them some training and support um, on how to speak confidently in public um, in front of people, giving them some support and understanding Green Party policy on contentious items in the local area um, are all things that can kind of help improve someone's confidence and encourage them to stand um, and kind of create a more level play playing field for them. Um, this needs to be happening well in advance of uh, the nominations coming in and because when you are asking someone from a more marginalised background to stand, you often need to take a, a cut. It takes a couple of tries, so you won't get them on the first time. At least um, when the person, Peter Underwood, was encouraging me to stand as a councillor, <laughs> he did not get me on the first time, um, and he had to keep coming back and trying and persisting. Um, but through that trying and persisting in various conversations, answering all of my silly questions about what it's like to be a councillor. Um, I thought actually yes this is the right decision for me and I'd love to be able to represent my residents um, and so it can be quite a journey but being kind understanding and persisting um, can get you wonderful candidates that are representative of, of the areas and that's what we need to be seeing more of. Thank you so much Rhea and this is just a good opportunity to say once again thank you so much for everything you're doing I think you do is so proud as a Green Party councillor. I think you do is so proud in London as a Londoner as well, an elected representative, and I couldn't be happier that that we saw you get elected. And long may your good work continue. Um, Richard, I'm just going to come to you finally then, um, especially because you said you gave a rambling answer as your last answer. So it's just a final opportunity. Is there, is there anything you think we should really know or, or any call to action you want us to hear? Well, I, I do think that we need to understand that inequality is not just about poverty. Um, I think many people think that they almost mean the same thing. Uh, and I think that uh, many on the right imagine that with economic growth, uh, inequality ceases to matter. And I think Blair thought that it mattered in the 1930s when so many of the population were in such squalor and hardship, it was then wrong for other people to be living in great luxury. But now that most of the poor, I mean, if you take the bottom 20% of the country, uh, most of the poor have got the main uh, consumer electronics, fridges, freezers, um, two or three bedroom flats and so on. Uh, and people start thinking, Inequality doesn't matter. This isn't real hardship. But actually, it's those feelings of inferiority, being looked down on, being di discounted, 
And it's actually those feelings that trigger violence. You know, when I'm disrespected, loss of face, humiliation, that's why violence is so more, is much more common in more unequal societies. Um, and we really need to understand these psychological effects of inequality that are extraordinarily par powerful um, and uh, really, as I was saying, destroy the quality of life. Um, and people are right to, to point out uh, the contrast with countries like Denmark. Um, and, and that's what we have to gain uh, as a society uh, by moving towards much greater equality. Thank you very much, Professor Wilkinson. And uh, I think it's very obvious to say, but still worth saying, you brought an incredible amount of insight and really helped our discussion tonight. And thank you so much for your time and everything that you're doing in the space you're working in. Uh, that leads me to say thank you so much to everyone for joining in and logging on tonight. I appreciate for 99.9% .9 of people your question probably wasn't asked, but I hope that you still heard lots in other people's responses. And ultimately, this is a conversation that we're not going to solve or finish in 90 minutes. And this is an ongoing discussion. There will be other panelists, uh, uh, sorry, panel discussions on inequality going on in the future. And of course, this is a constant conversation that are happening within Green Party spaces, I would say, every single day, both in elected external spaces, but also in our own internal party groups. If you would like to get more involved, I would involve, um, uh, encourage everyone to get more involved with Green Party discussions. I think being part of democracy and politics isn't just about voting at election time, although of course that is a huge part of it, but actually it's about voting every time you're voting for a councillor or someone on your school board, or um, any time you can engage with democracy, and that includes getting involved with our policy working groups. Um, if you would like to become a Green Party friend, the link is in the chat. Green Party friends give a small contribution each month, and that helps to grow our Green Voice, uh, both within the national media and within our local communities. Also, by being a Green Party member, though, that means you can create policy. Any member has the, uh, the power to come up with policy and ask people in their local party or beyond to sign that policy. And once it's got a certain amount of signatures, that then goes to our Green Party conference. Green Party policy is decided at Green Party conference. So that means the leadership, the spokespeople, the entire Green Party team, everyone who's elected and everyone who's running on the Green Party platform is following conference policy. And you can be a part of that exciting movement. I was so excited to be at conference uh, the weekend before last I spoke to two first timers at the end of the conference or the first plenary as it was called debate and said how are you finding it and they said it feels amazing it feels like you're being part of creating history and you can do that too by joining the green party thank you again so much to all our panelists thank you very much and have a good evening <laughs>